I mean, for example, one of the earliest um, uh, Japanese animations is a, mm -hmm. uh, a government information film about the spread of syphilis, <laughs> uh, really? which is fantastic because, firstly, this is clearly an adult animation we, we, we you know we, every, and all these people say oh well anime isn't just kid stuff anymore anime wasn't kid stuff then hey welcome to japan station my name is tony vega all right so episode three we're back and today i'm joined by dr jonathan clements now jonathan is a guy that i could spend the entire episode talking about just because well he's done so many interesting things and written so many books but can't do that <laughs> All right, so let's let's shorten it up a bit. So Jonathan is a prolific writer, uh, a historian, a researcher, an expert on Asia and Japan and Japanese animation. He wrote a book called Anime a History, and that takes a comprehensive look at the entire history of Japanese animation from its very, well, beginnings. We talk a little bit about that in today's episode, but actually we focus more on a recent book that he wrote called Sacred Sailors. And that book is all about Japan's first ever feature-length animated film. It's called Momotaro Sacred Sailors, right? If you haven't heard of it, don't be surprised because <laughs> it came out in April of 1945. It's a World War II era propaganda film and it disappeared after the war ended. People thought it had been completely destroyed until they found a copy of it in 1983 they rescreened it and in 2017 they remastered it and released it it's it's <laughs> yeah you can go get it on blu-ray but anyway the movie itself is just bizarre and a fascinating fascinating look at this very specific period in history okay and the movie follows the story of these anthropomorphic animal soldiers who represent japan and they go off to fight at the pacific islands and they're led by General Momotaro. <laughs> okay. Now, if you're not familiar with Momotaro, well, he's probably Japan's most famous fairy tale character. Uh, he's the peach boy. Okay. So the story goes that there was this giant peach that floated down the river. An old man, old woman found it. They split it open. There was a baby inside. The baby grows up into this strong, super powerful young man. And then he goes off to Onigashima, which is this island full of demons. And the demons have been terrorizing the lands, stealing from the people, including the town where he's from. He defeats the Oni, the demons, and everybody lives happily ever after. So Momotaro in the movie is a general leading Japanese forces and there's paratroopers and airplanes and they fight the British and there's a scene where Popeye surrenders. <laughs> okay, Popeye makes a illegal cameo, I guess you could say. And it all culminates in this very, very strange scene where, well, potentially, a British POW was forced to voice act for the movie to play the part of a surrendering British officer. <laughs> think about that okay so we talk about that in the interview but we also talk about the behind the scenes right so the movie was directed by Mitsuyo Seo an animator who also fell into obscurity after World War II uh, he was commissioned by the Japanese Navy to make this movie and suffice it to say it was not easy okay he didn't have enough cells he didn't have enough animators and he was just revolutionizing the way that people were animating things at the time right like they were looking at American animation like Disney and they were amazed and they wanted to keep up with that it was like the space race but with animation <laughs> Okay, so just really, really fascinating stuff. Jonathan is, well, to say he's passionate would be an understatement. So anyway, sit back, relax, and prepare to get educated by the amazing Jonathan Clements. The next stop is Japan Station. The doors on the right side will open. So I'm I'm particularly interested in talking about kind of the early uh, history of what would eventually become known as anime. Um, I know 
we're I want to talk a little bit about sacred sailors as well. Um, but I think before we get to that, if you could kind of give me a general idea of what are kind of the beginnings of uh, Japanese animation, um, where did it kind of start and how it evolved into uh, to get to that point where uh, sacred sailors and the animation industry got to, I don't know, like in that World War Two propaganda era. Hmm. Well, our idea of when Japanese animation began is very much mobile because there is no evidence uh, that we can really rely on. Um, almost everything in the Japanese animation business before 1923 was destroyed in the Great Kanto Earthquake. Mm-hmm. And that includes you know, all the films and a lot of the documents surrounding them. And there wasn't really any dedicated um, journal um, that talked specif- specifically about animation um, for decades um, after the industry began. So animation was very much a trick film thing. It was a sideshow in carnivals. It was and also ran at um, nights at the cinema. You know, you go to the cinema and you would see a newsreel and you would see a main feature and there may be some kind of live vaudeville act and there'd be cartoons as well. But what those cartoons were was were often interchangeable, and so there was no real record of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so officially, we say 1917 because that is when the first um, cartoons uh, are mentioned in Japanese texts, and it's when uh, one of the earliest um, Japanese animators says that he made um, the first cartoon. However, Frederick Litton, who's just published a book about um, Japanese animation in the 19 teens, says that much of this evidence is fabricated. That you've got a lot of people 20 years after the fact saying they did things, but with no real evidence of it, um, and he's been able to say this because he's been through um, newspaper archives from the time which are now available online uh, if you pay a huge amount of money if you're a university institution and so he's he, you know, there's, there's no record of these things even happening so he's very doubtful um, when Helen McCarthy and I published the third edition of the Anime Encyclopedia, we called it a century of Japanese animation secure in the knowledge that at some point after 2012, Japanese animation celebrated its centenary. Although right. no one really knows where that point is because there's still lots of argument about it. And people find things in attics and they find things in dusty corners of library libraries. And that completely changes our, our idea of what went where. However, for the record, um, in the late 19-teens and the early 1920s, a number of um, Japanese filmmakers started to work with graphics. I mean, of course, if you're making silent movies, you need intertitles and you need film titles. And that kind of labor to make those is the same as the kind of labor that you use to make special effects. And it's the same as the kind of labor you ultimately use to make animation. Um, There is an understanding that there are films coming in from France in particular, which was the center of the of the film business uh, until uh, World War One. so there are films turning up from France that are animated and there are people in Japan who are imitating those films, uh, particularly Seitaro Kitayama, uh, who is the man who claims to be uh, the, the founder of the, uh, of the Japanese animation business. Um, mm-hmm. And these are very experimental films and they're very short films. Um, we're talking about single reels, so they last about four minutes or maybe a two-reeler uh, up to eight minutes. And so the history of animation in Japan is one of very slow development from what begins as a cottage industry sometimes it's literally two guys in their living room trying to make um, a cartoon by hand and it slowly develops through the 1920s um, into more of an actual industry and it's in the 1930s that it becomes a real going concern for people and this is actually um, counterintuitive as well because it's not really about entertainment at this point the the entertaining end of Japanese animation is the thing that people remember. It's privileged in historical accounts. It's what the animation studies people want to talk about. But um, the, these were often not profitable. Um, it's instructional works. It's advertising. Um, it's government information films that really make Japanese animation a going concern for the people who make it. And of course, a lot of these things are sometimes not even screened in cinemas. They're shown in you know town halls. Um, or I mean, for example, one of the earliest um, uh, Japanese animations is a mm-hmm. uh, a government information film about the spread of syphilis. <laughs> uh, really? which is fantastic because firstly this is clearly an adult 
animation. We, we, we you know, we, and all these people say, oh, well, anime isn't just kid stuff anymore. Anime wasn't kid stuff then. Um, but also, this is, you know, it's not something that's shown in cinemas. It's something that was maybe shown to, to soldiers and people posted to Manchuria. Um, so it's not really anything uh, that is part of the general narrative of animation history. And so during the 1930s, as the Japanese empire is expanding, as Japan is becoming increasingly right wing and wants more and more control over the media that its citizens is seeing, eventually foreign films are pushed out of the Japanese market and this creates this huge vacuum which is funded by the government and particularly by the Japanese Navy um, to create local films that appeal to local values um, after 1925 in Japan it was illegal to release any form of media that was regarded as a threat to national identity which is a nicely vague and slightly sinister idea. Um, and so what you get after 1925 is people become increasingly fearful of trying anything that's going to buck the system, but the system itself is paying for all of these propaganda films. And so while it's common to say that propaganda films uh, are a World War II phenomenon, in fact, uh, in Japan, uh, arguably, the conflict began in 1931, uh, rather than in in, uh, in 1939, as it does in Europe, or in 1941, as it did in Hawaii. Um, and so you're looking at a 15-year a, a period where an increasingly militarized country is throwing more and more money into Japanese animation, and all, and all forms of propaganda. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was working on my doctorate, which turned into the book Anime, A History, Mm -hmm. I was originally planning to write about the kind of damage that was done to the animation business during World War II, and that turned yeah. out to be completely untrue. In fact, World War II was this massive boom time in Japanese animation, um, and because of the huge amounts of funding, it's like a space program. They keep on breaking the sound barrier <laughs> and coming up with new right. forms of technology, and the films are getting longer and longer and longer, so they go through the three-reel barrier and the four-reel barrier, and they're using uh -huh. sound, and, and suddenly you get a film with seven reels, uh, which yeah. is 37 minutes long, which is not what we would call feature length but is uh -huh. big enough to become an item on its own on a cinema program so people go to see that cartoon and they right. kind of bulk it out with a speech from a navy guy at the beginning and some children's activities at the end and they try and make it stretch into a feature length and mm -hmm. then and that film was uh, Momotaro Sea Eagles made by yeah. um uh, Mitsuyo Seo in right. uh, 1943 and it was because of the success of that film that the Japanese Navy came back and said okay we will take a feature length film mm -hmm. uh, and that in itself was uh, part of a kind of media war uh, because the Chinese had made a film called A Princess Iron Fan which was feature length Right, um, and uh, this was shown in Japan because it was made in Shanghai so as far as the Japanese were concerned it wasn't a foreign film because Shanghai was kind of part of the Japanese empire at the time uh -huh. um, and the Japanese navy was actually embarrassed the Chinese had kind of beaten them uh, to get to right. feature length in this way um, so they very swiftly threw money at Mitsuyo Seo to get him to make uh, Momotaro's um, uh, Momotaro's mm -hmm. Sacred Sailors which is the first uh, feature length film um, in Japanese right. animation um, al although the reason that Seo was chosen is kind of ironic is that he was chosen because he wasn't famous enough all of the big names in Japanese animation in the 1920s were getting far too much work making instructional videos, um, manuals for soldiers about torpedoes. Um, one animator, Tomio Sagisu, claimed that the, uh, the pilots who attacked Pearl Harbor were taught how to do so with an animated film. Um, right, with, yeah, I know, read that. Yeah. Not with funny little animals, but with um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, schematic diagrams showing how to dive and how to you know, fire their torpedoes and so on. Mm -hmm. And so all of the all of the really big name animators who who were doing well for themselves were working behind the scenes in instructional films. And Mitsuyo Seo wasn't famous enough. He he wasn't mm -hmm. kind of a big enough name. So he was like the last man standing. And they said, well, you can do the feature film for the kids. It's like mm -hmm. a Navy recruitment video. Yeah. Uh, and so that's how he ended up making Momotaro's uh, Sacred Sailors, yeah. um, which was released in 1945. Um, right. when most of the cinemas in Tokyo had been destroyed yeah. and when all the children had been evacuated to the countryside uh, who yeah. survived. Um, so there was very little audience for it. Um, I'm, uh, I'm curious. So actually today I, I 
stumbled across the movie online. I, yeah. I wasn't expecting it to be online, but I just saw it, and so I was kind of watching parts of it. And of course, the the pacing it's it, it's almost not fair to compare something from that era to something now. But I just have a difficult time imagining children sitting through these very long, uh, very slow paced uh, scenes that I, I saw. Like there were so many throughout the movie. Is hmm. that typical or, or is is that just me seeing it through my present day eyes? Well, well, firstly, let's state for the record that um, the version you're watching online is not complete. And it would be re- it would be remiss of me um, as someone who's paid to write a book by the company releasing the Blu-ray uh, not to point out that the Blu-ray edition actually has restored footage in it okay, um, okay. Uh, not, not that that's going to help uh, my, my answer to your question in any way because yes parts of it are slow paced um, there, there was a huge uh, argument in the media and mm-hmm. I suppose there still is about what it is children actually want to see and mm-hmm. the Navy wanted something that glorified the Navy completely um, not the army no the, the, the Japanese army and the Japanese Navy are basically fighting each other for resources so there's no mention of the army in the whole film um, uh, so, so the Navy wanted something that was all about fighting and all about war um, and Sayor said to them no no you've got to have a variation in pace you can't have a two hour fight scene obviously right. he said this before anyone had thought of Dragon Ball Z um, <laughs> so he said you can't have a two hour fr- the fight scene you, you, you've got to have things that put it in context and explain why we're fighting and and for me that's really what makes this such an interesting document because sacred sailors just stops the film for 20 minutes and shows you how to build a base um, and how to do a a social outreach program with the local natives (laughs) and how to teach them japanese and um, Uh and 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 sayor found this fascinating um because he was very interested in something um that is uh beyond propaganda which is a kind of embedded propaganda, the idea that once you've conquered a country, you need to win the hearts and minds of its people. Um, and in fact, that song that's sung in Sacred Sailors when they try and teach them the Japanese alphabet is from one of these embedded propaganda films, I think uh. shown in Indonesia or, or Malaya or somewhere. <laughs> Um, Uh So, uh, Seo himself had this idea in his head that it shouldn't be slow paced. Uh, Sorry, is that there should be a variation of pace. Um, But I think he was also hobbled by the fact that the film was pre-scored, which means that the audio was recorded in advance. And so, even though he was suffering all kinds of logistical problems, I mean, his staff kept on getting drafted. (laughs) <laughs> um, so he kept on losing animators um, and by the end of the film you know, much of it was being complete, completed by um, a crew of former waitresses um, because all, all, all the men had been drafted um, he, he kept on losing staff, he kept on losing resources they kept on running out of materials they had to wash their cells in acid and use them again, which means there's very little surviving of the original materials uh, You know, there's a fire at the studio um, uh, all kinds of issues that they're facing um, but he, he's stuck with this soundtrack that he has to keep to mm-hmm. he can't just rip bits out of it so I who, think who maybe... decided that how, is that just how movies were done you would get the soundtrack done and then they would have it, to it, animate no, to it no I mean it, it, it varies in, in, uh-huh. in Japanese animation there are, there are three or four different ways of, of mm-hmm. recording the sound you can record the sound um, to, a, to a work print which is not quite finished but you but you you have some idea from the animatics of where you're going you can record the sound after something's finished which of course when you're dubbing a foreign thing that's already complete is very common and you can uh, record the sound in advance and there's also a, a form called mitereko which is when you record the sound but you also video the person doing the voice so you get some idea of their facial expressions which is something Disney use a lot and Pixar in, in modern times. Back then pre-scoring was just, uh, I think it was a good way of them showing that they'd completed a certain milestone in the production mm. Um, mm. but the trouble is is that because of the way that censorship works in wartime Japan, you finish a film then you have to submit it to the censor Mm-hmm. And they ran into all kinds of trouble with the censor because the Navy were really angry about a scene in which one of the soldiers is killed. 
Mm -hmm. uh, there's a funeral for a bunny that they had to take out the final <laughs> film and uh -huh. they were really annoyed that, that the scene of the of the bombers as they come in to attack um, Devil's Island shows the correct formation for Japanese bombers and fighter escort including uh -huh. the number of planes used and so, so he had to cut all of that out so there are bits in the film where you can see there are sudden jumps where even though he was keeping to this he's had to slice pieces away right um so all of those change the pacing of the film. Um, and uh, I think that um, the idea of um, what we would now call a Gantt chart or a dope sheet that mm -hmm. really breaks down the story into punchy storyboarded sections. So yeah. there's never a dull moment. That's mm -hmm. really something that, although they understood how it worked uh, in Japan in the 1920s, I mean, the Gantt chart is a, is a 20s invention. Um, it's not something that was really introduced in the animation business until after the war, because we've still got people feeling their way through how to tell a story and you know, how to cut corners and that kind of thing now um i'm kind of interested in the um the role that western animation was playing in terms of influence so for example yeah. i remember reading that you know 1941 was when fantasia came out and so they were kind of started to worry like oh look this thing came out and this is amazing and then there's also uh bluto right from popeye he was in yeah. the original so it seems like there was certainly um influence creeping its way in despite the fact that japan was trying so hard to uh get rid of any yeah. traces of w the west at that time there's certainly a, a dividend that particularly American cartoons get to play um, in, the, in the 30s and the 40s because um, with, for want of a better word they were better than the Japanese mm -hmm. versions I, I yeah. mean that we have we have um, biographical accounts by people who went on to become famous animators saying that when the Western films were banned they were so angry because the Western films were turning up in color Mm -hmm. And this was this incredible, vibrant color thing that would be yeah. uh, an amazing experience. And that was now denied them. And so you get with the animators of the 1940s a definite respect, particularly for Disney and the Fleischer brothers, um, because as fellow animators, they could see that um, they were doing much better than them, often because of money. I mean, you throw money at a problem enough and you can make the problem go away. Yeah. What's interesting about Disney uh, is that Disney was uh, pretty much on the skids um, by 1940, and it's only mm -hmm. World War II that brought in funding for Disney to make propaganda right. films and instructional films. I mean, I, I don't know if you know this, the longest Disney film ever made is, is a five-hour Beechcraft airplane uh, um, repair manual. Is that it came it's out not, in the forties? It came 19th. out in the forties. It was a, it was a wartime yeah. film, and and it was uh, yeah. designed as a kind of lecture for for mechanics. But it's the longest film Disney ever made. But it's hardly <laughs> uh -huh. it's not screened at festivals anymore. So anyway, yeah. um, Disney was running way into the red um, on its cartoons, but the Japanese didn't necessarily know this. So the fact mm -hmm. that the Fleischer brothers and Disney had bankrupted themselves almost by by putting out these quality cartoons, the Japanese weren't aware of this. So they were assuming that these cartoons were being supported by the market which is which only became true in the very very long term mm -hmm. and of course also uh, they are incredibly uh, a, a incredibly high level of technological achievement mm -hmm. so uh, in 41 uh, I'm, I'm sure you remember this uh, from, from my book the, the, yeah. um, the Japanese acquire by mm -hmm. boarding a ship and stealing it a mm -hmm. copy of Fantasia right. and they bring it to Tokyo and they're treating it like nuclear waste it's like a secret <laughs> that no one can talk about and yeah. they invite a very small select group of animators to come in and see it so they can see what the enemy is up to Mm -hmm. And they show it's like two dozen people. And um, the, the details of this event is something that I've had to piece together from other people talking about it because mm -hmm. no one actually admitted to being in the room, but somebody mentioned that someone else was in the room and then you know mm -hmm. where they were at a certain time and you can <laughs> pull bits together. Mm -hmm. And it's only really in the last... 15 years that Tomio Sagisu um, published he, posthumously his memoirs were published and he actually revealed yes he was there and he sat there in the dark crying um, at how wonderful this film was and, he, and, and then the, <laughs> the Navy's there saying okay well we've got to beat these people how are we going to beat these people and they're like, but it's in colour and they yeah. spent you know thousands of dollars on it yeah <laughs> so um, yes Fantasia is a, is a very powerful uh um, influence uh, on animation at the time. They were the people who were working on it, particularly the upper echelons, were well aware of it. Um, they had very fond memories of the Fleischer Brothers. They had very fond memories of Merry Melodies, and these are all things that um, the, uh, the Japanese animators were trying to fight. Um, but they were 
hobbled in a way by the by the censorship requirements um mm-hmm. i mean in 1943 kenzo masaoka released the spider and the tulip which was a real mm-hmm. attempt to do a kind of merry melodies thing it's kind of musical about a uh, a ladybird who um who you know escapes uh, an evil spider um mm-hmm. and the film was panned by critics at the time because it wasn't um patriotic enough Mm-hmm. I mean, Kenzo Masaoka, basically his career as a director was, was almost over at that point because he'd made a film that wasn't pro-military enough. It was talking about nature at a time when really they wanted to be talking about guns. Um, and but more, he, So he became an animator working for his former student, uh, Mitsuyo Seo. And, and, mm-hmm. and that's really what saved his career because, on, on working on Sacred Sailors because otherwise he, he would have been dead in the water. Hmm. Um. I remember reading in an interview that you uh, did, uh, I believe it was with Anime News Network, and that was specifically regarding um, anime, a history, when that Mm -hmm. book came out. Um, And you said that one of the most uh, important things in in writing the book that you needed was uh, skepticism. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm I'm interested, because right now you kind of described how you tried to piece together uh, what happened when they showed Fantasia? Uh, so what? What is it? How is the research process for something like this? How does skepticism play a role in all this? How do you kind of get to what the best version of the truth possible for these kind of episodes that are so hard to you know get access to? Right. Well. Um there's a lot of reading involved um, mm-hmm. for for anime history. Um, mm-hmm. The the policy was is that I tried to find every book published by people working in the Japanese animation field, every memoir and every biography I could find, and I read through them all. Um, and uh, you may not know this, but for some bizarre reason, very few of the books published in Japan in this field have indexes. <laughs> okay. um, um, maybe maybe one in ten if you're lucky. Um, uh-huh. So I ended up writing my own index. I wrote a concordance which goes on for 400 pages oh of what the indexes should be for these Japanese uh-huh. books, and that allows you to draw immediate connections between things because it's searchable. It's just a word file, so it's searchable. So when the subject of Momotaro comes up, for example, or the subject of Fantasia, I can just type it in, and I can see. Every, every place it's shown up in all these different memoirs and that's when you can start to piece together um, different views of the same thing because the problem is is that when you're dealing with testimonial evidence you know any, anyone giving evidence from their own point of view there are certain errors that can creep in they can try to push themselves into the narrative make themselves more important than they should be um, when you're dealing with Japanese uh, interviewees mm-hmm. sometimes it's the exact opposite they try and make themselves less important um, right. they don't want to you know look like they're being pushy um, they privilege things that look good versus things that don't there's a there's a research bias where they they talk about things that were successes rather than things that were failures often it's the failures that are the most interesting mm-hmm. um, and uh, often there'll be other influences as well like uh, what we call a commemoration error which is where if someone's died everyone tries to say nice things about them right even if they were a terrible person yeah, yeah. Um, so you have to fix all these things together there's a, a there's a historical theorist called Alan McGill from Canada mm-hmm. and he talks about the errors of historical practice and I kind of applied his ideas of the kind of mistakes people can make in history to the anime business it's very important when dealing with anime to remember that so much of the material that we have particularly in modern times is designed to sell it to you mm-hmm. sure if, yeah. it's, if it's sleeve notes if it's an interview online if it's anything that they're trying to sell you something and this means that there is there is already a bias there of trying to make you want to see it, trying to make you want to buy it. Um, and uh, as Frederick Litton pointed out with the materials from the 19 teens, this was true then as well. People are trying to tell you, I was the first animator. I made a film, but it was destroyed in the earthquakes and no one's seen it. But you should make me the first animator because then I get invited to the film festivals. And then, you know, I get you know interviewed by the magazines and then I get more money for my contracts. So that there's all these kind of personal biases. And this is true in any kind of media history. Um, when it comes to Japanese media, though, I think so many people are far too trusting of the official mm-hmm. story that they get. Yeah. And so that's what I mean by skepticism is that, you know, you, you see someone talking about a development and, uh, and you try and get behind it. You try and work out 
what their agenda is and why they might be not necessarily be lying. I mean, some of them do mm. just lie, but why they might be mistaken. Mm. Um, there, there, there may be other pieces of a production that they're not aware of that influence the way that things are done. So, uh, for example, Star of the Giants, which is the baseball anime that invented right. hyperrealism, really. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, the reason for hyperrealism in anime uh, depends on who you're talking to because you have people who worked on Star of the Giants as animators saying um, they needed to stretch an episode so it lasted for 25 minutes but they only had two minutes mm -hmm. of material so they slowed things down and they zoomed in mm -hmm. and they, they um, but then you have people who worked on it as writers saying no we needed to stretch an episode because we'd run out of manga mm -hmm. and we, we were adapting the manga and we, we, we only got two volumes left so we were trying to make things go slowly so different people are taking the credit for different parts of the production and you right. need to kind of weigh in the balance all of these things to work mm -hmm. out you know what what the truth may be and and sometimes you just don't know what the truth is and the best mm -hmm. thing you can do is you can present the evidence that different people gave and and then leave it to them yeah. um in, in the case of sacred sailors for example Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the there aren't that many issues with the with the production itself necessarily, although there are bits of it missing now. Mm -hmm. But Osamu Tezuka, the the godfather right. of Japanese uh, uh, comics, uh, championed the film in the 1980s, mm -hmm. making all kinds of claims for his love for it that mm -hmm. aren't actually backed up by his own diaries. So it's like Tezuka enjoyed the film when he was young and saw it in the 1940s and then kind of forgot about it for 20, 30 years. And then suddenly in the 1980s, when it's discovered again, he's like, oh, I've always loved this film. This is my favorite film. This is the film that made me want to become an animator. And of course, uh -huh. that story gets him onto television and it, get, you know, yeah. it allows him to kind of barge in to the interviews but I actually have my doubts as to the degree to which Tezuka really cared about this film until there was a reason for him to do so in the 1980s uh -huh. um, and but I remember in the book too you talk about his diaries and, and um, but the, were, the diaries were just something that he kept for himself and it wasn't something that perhaps he saw down the line would be published do you, do you have any exactly exactly okay. and and, okay. and and this is this is one of the things with uh with historical analysis is that mm -hmm. when somebody keeps a diary um the original as written down is a primary source when that diary is published it's a secondary source it dates from a later period in time it's not what we call synchronic anymore so um, for example, uh, this, this applies to Tezuka, but it also applies to Yoshiyuki Tomino, the creator of Gundam. He, he published um, a book of his diaries um, in, uh, I think, the 1990s, um, but the diaries themselves date from the 1960s. And, and in the intervening time, of course, Tomino has the opportunity to reach in and correct mistakes and to remember things that he hasn't actually remembered but he's read in someone else's book and that kind of mm -hmm. prompts him to do something and so it's very difficult to say unless you have the original diary in your hand handwritten to what extent a published diary actually comes from the the time in which it claims to have been written and that's mm -hmm. one of the kind of self-serving ways i mean this is this is the nature of autobiography yeah. uh, and it's the difference between autobiography which is someone looking back on their life with consideration and testimonial which is someone just telling you what happened sometimes as it happened mm -hmm. um and what were some of the main sources then for sacred sailors my sources for sacred sailors um mm -hmm. There, uh, well, firstly, the film itself still exists, which makes yeah. a huge difference uh, sure. in Japanese animation. Um, secondly, although Seo himself um, uh, gave a couple of interviews about it, uh, one when it was rediscovered, and one in a in a collection of uh, children's stories, um, there's a. Uh, a writer, a critic called Hajime Komatsuzawa, who interviewed him in the 1980s. It was a fantastic interview with lots of really good material right. about the production. Um, Is that also, where the quotes are primarily from then? The quotes from Seo are from Hajime Komatsuzawa's interview, um, from an interview in a book uh, which interviewed children's illustrators, because oh. after his film career failed, Mitsuyo Seo became a children's illustrator, and he did a very long interview with a uh, in a very obscure book in the 1980s about that. But also, uh, when the film was was broadcast on Japanese television for the first time in the 1980s. Um, he appeared on a, I think, a half-hour program with Tezuka, talking about the film and his experiences really? in it. And um, the, 
the people uh, at, uh, the, at the studio uh, very kindly sent me a transcript of the whole uh, wow. interview, uh, which was also very useful. But beyond that, we also have um, his production assistant, um, Mochinaga Tadahito, who didn't work on uh, Sacred Sailors, to my knowledge, but did work on Momotaro's Sea Eagles. He published his memoirs, uh, once again posthumously. Mm -hmm. uh, his wife, he was working on it when he died, and his wife kind of fixed it up. So there's lots of material about Sale's work in the 40s in um, uh, Mochinaga Tadahito's book. And the other source is um, Sugiso Tomio. Um, who uh, went on to become a relatively minor animator in the 70s, in the 60s and 70s. He published his own memoirs, um, and he was very much part of that scene as well. And so uh, some of the quotes are, are from his book, talking about the kind of things that he went through in the 40s and his, his encounters with the, the big animators of the day. So, you know, there's a patchwork of materials there to work from, um, which is, uh, you know, very difficult to put together. Um, and, uh, and of course, there are some materials that are, are lost forever. There are certain scenes that were cut from the film, which right. survived. Um, I mean, in, in Sacred Sailors, for example, there's uh, Popeye surrenders. Yeah. at the end of the film uh, you won't see that in the online version because mm -hmm. um, when the film was rediscovered they actually cut that out in the 80s they were afraid they'd get sued by a, <laughs> a King Feature Syndicate but yeah. in in 2017 they actually went to the owners of Popeye and asked if it would be okay mm -hmm. and the owner said yes it would in the interests of historical uh, accuracy and context so, mm -hmm. so that Popeye footage is actually back in the film as released on Blu-ray yeah. um, so there's all kinds of little bits and pieces like that that you can play with um, um, but the real thing that made it possible for me is, is the existence of my concordance because okay. you know one, once a film is cropped up in several people's books then you mm -hmm. suddenly have a, a a basket of sources that you can choose from and you're not, you're not just relying on a single one is that what kind of sparked you your motivation to write it after you had done your um, the previous book anime history and then you saw these connections I've been championing Sacred Sailors for mm -hmm. years. That there was a point in time when I had the only copy in Europe, and so I'd do oh. speeches about it at various different, you know, conventions and film festivals and things, um, because it was such an interesting obscurity. And of course, the fact is, is that it was believed to be destroyed for for forty years. People thought it was a, a one of these lost films and then suddenly it shows up again and it's such a window on as you said yourself such a different world and mm -hmm. different expectations on the part of the filmmakers and the audience so i've mm -hmm. always been very keen on it and uh andrew partridge who owns anime limited uh in in britain uh he came to see me talking about it at the um, japan society of scotland about 12 or 13 years ago and so he's always had the film in his mind and he started pushing um, the Japanese and pushing Funimation in America to try and do a remastered edition and when he finally got a remastered edition off the ground he asked me if I'd write a book that went with it um, and that's my Sacred Sailors book um, so uh, but, but the Sacred Sailors book is very much a continuation of my history of anime mm -hmm. because I've got all the materials there I've got kind of escape velocity with the materials and I can go back to the concordance and go okay well if, if we pick a film at random if we pick Sacred Sailors do we have enough to produce a 25,000 word book on it and the answer is yes um, there, there are some films where it's not possible but I can also tell that by looking at the concordance yeah. um, since Sacred Sailors I've actually written another book about Haku Jarden oh, okay. uh, which is the, uh, the first colour Japanese animated film ah, yes, um, yes. and I, I wrote a book about that with Andrew Osman last year and that's, mm -hmm. that's still in the production process at the moment but we, oh. we did the same thing we you know, went through and found was there enough materials about all the scandals at the studio? Yes, there was. So, you know, we can put that together. And of course, as time goes on, the, the real problem becomes noise. It becomes, you know, you get too much material yeah. on something like Gundam, for example, uh, uh, or Ghost in the Shell. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's got something to say. Um, so then you have to sift through and try and find out if you've got enough material that you can really use. Um, something that I found particularly... Um strange and amusing I, i'm not sure what the right word is um was the uh the english speaking guy at the end mm. that surrenders and yeah. today when i was able to watch uh parts of motaro of course i i saw that scene and it is so strange um you can't i i 
I, it's like you don't know if he's scared, if he's just really acting badly, if he's trying to act scared. He's got this stutter, this strange cadence. It, it's yeah. it's just so bizarre. And and yeah, it, I, it, it's, we we agree, sir. We agree, sir. Yes, sir. Please, sir, if you're not stop your general attack. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, we agree to uh, unconditional surrender. Yes, yes, yes certainly. Unconditional surrender. Yes, yes, certainly. It's a fascinating scene, mm -hmm. and it's probably the first English language voice acting in Japanese animation. Uh -huh. And the question is, is where did they find these people? Yeah, you know, you, you've got this man who, to my mind, is speaking native. English. He seems to be a native British English speaker. And as you say, he's got this really weird intonation when he mm -hmm. speaks. Mm -hmm. um, and it's possible that he's being told to act scared and he's just doing what he's being told. It's yeah. possible that he's in fear for his life. It's possible he's trying to sabotage the production mm -hmm. by speaking as badly as he can. But yeah. nobody knows who these people are. And I had a bit of a fight with Hajime Matsuzawa about this because um, I asked him if he had any clues. Um, I, I suggested you know, maybe they're prisoners of war or something. He said, no, what a stupid thing to say. You know, he, They would never use prisoners of war in a civilian context, even for a propaganda film. He's absolutely convinced that these, um, these soldiers uh, in the film are being played by um, sympathizers with the Japanese cause. He suggested people from India... Uh, uh -huh. which had uh, a, 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 a pro-Japanese um, anti-white uh, coalition that, that might have supplied some people. But I, I'm pretty sure I'd be able to spot an Indian accent, even if we're talking yeah. about some, you know, Sandhurst-educated officer. It, mm -hmm. it seemed to me to be a genuine uh, British-English speaker. Mm -hmm. What I, and the, the problem with the argument that they might be collaborators is not borne out by what they say to one another, mm -hmm. because it's not in the script and it's not subtitled. Mm -hmm. But they actually turn to each other and whisper in the film, you know, don't worry, we can stall them. We've already won. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I couldn't quite make out what was, you know, in those little um because there's the main the guy speaking and then you yeah. hear like the other voices in the background. That's but right, I, but well, yeah. it's, it's much clearer on the Blu-ray. He said, okay. just vlogging the Blu-ray. Um, <laughs> you can actually hear, he says, yeah. we can stall them. We have already won. Uh -huh. And that is such a subversive message to put into a propaganda film yeah. being paid for by the Japanese Navy. Yeah. Um, and it's difficult to imagine that that was scripted. Um, uh, but even so, the way it is spoken is kind of stilted. It's not uh, it's a native speaker reading a script by a non-native speaker, which is uh -huh. also very confusing. So that's one of the really big mysteries with Sacred Sailors, is where they found these people to play the surrendering British. Right. Yeah, that was yeah, just fascinating. I guess it's just one of those things that we may never know. <laughs> mm. huh. um, so, uh, as for the movie in general, um, you know, I... I I found it particularly interesting, and I was reminded of this when you mentioned the interview with Osamu Tezuka, how hmm. um, Osamu Tezuka, he's remembered today as, of course, the godfather of anime. He's, he's like the biggest figure, perhaps, next to Hayao Miyazaki there, like at the top of hmm. when you talk about anime, it's, it's them too. But um, he was in this interview with uh, Mitsuyo Seo, and it was Osamu Tezuka who would die shortly after that interview. Yes. But Mitsuyo would continue. However, despite his role in this influential movie, in this landmark mm. movie, he's not really remembered for the most part mm. by people in that's, general. That's that's right. I mean, he died in relative obscurity. He died in 2010. He he lived. He was 99 years old. Uh, 89 years old when he died. No, no, 99 years old when he died. Wow. Um, and uh, he, his career was basically over in, I think, 47, um, because the irony with Seo is that he was a committed socialist. And so after being forced to work uh, for the Japanese military during the war, he was kind of purged during the Cold War in the, uh, the anti-red scares of, of the 40s and 50s. So he just kind of gave up on animation and, and went to become a children's book illustrator. And he worked for almost 30 years illustrating children's books had his completely different career yeah. and retired in the 1970s and then had another 30 years <laughs> of, um, of of just doing nothing really mm -hmm. um, 
So that's quite an amazing career. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's an amazing generation that you're dealing with. Um, Tezuka uh, himself as well, also an amazing generation, because you're dealing with with people who've who've seen so much technological change in their lives. Um, I've, I've been I've had to write a lot of obituaries in the anime world recently, um, mainly because of Tezuka, because he expanded the industry by fourfold yeah. in 1963. He, he hired so many new animators that basically there are four times as many people, and they were all in their 20s when they were hired, so they're all kind of dying off now. So there's lots of kind of big names in the anime business dying. And you see people who have representative works across six different decades, mm -hmm. and that's you know really quite a shocking yeah. sort of output to see. When it comes to Tezuka. Um, there's there's a lot of revisionism around him, uh, partly caused by his own stuff, by oh, yeah. his own actions. To be honest, I mean he's um he's very possessive about his material, and he has a fantastic uh, estate. The, the, mm. the legacy management of Tezuka's estate is better than anybody else's. Uh -huh. Tezuka Pro is an going concern. It has a real respect for managing what he achieved and, and of keeping his work in the public eye. Um, and they're very easy to deal with, unlike a lot of Japanese studios. Oh, really? So, you know, yeah, so if you want to have, uh, there's a reason why Astro Boy is on the cover of the anime encyclopedia. And mm -hmm. it's not just that Astro Boy was the first TV um, anime, it, mm -hmm. it's that, you know, Tezuka are really kind and helpful when wow. you want to put something on the cover of a book hmm. so um, he's got very good legacy management and uh, undoubtedly he was an incredible figure in the animation business the trouble is is that he shines so brightly that there are other figures from his era who are completely pushed into the shadows um, particularly someone like Mitsutero Yokoyama for example who uh, and uh, who I, if I remember rightly, Yokoyama died in a, there was a fire at his studio and uh -huh. he lost almost all of his papers. Okay. So unlike someone like Tesco who has this huge archive to draw upon, um, Yokoyama's material kind of just disappears into the void. Oh, wow. Um, um, Shotaro Ishinomori is, is another one, a huge figure, uh, very much a competitor with Tezuka in his day, remembered today for Power Rangers oh, um, really? and not for a whole bunch of other things that mm. he, he worked on. Um, and so th these are big, influential figures, but Tezuka has all the attention, and I'm constantly kind of warring with myself about the degree to which we should believe that. Because on a good day, I wake up and I think, no, this is absolutely true. He really was who he said he was. <laughs> His achievement, when you, when you look at what yeah. he achieved in his life and the sheer prolificity of his output, yeah. it's incredible. And then you say, yeah, but Mr. Teriyokuyama did all these other things and he did that thing before Tezuka did, but Tezuka took the credit. And, and so um, there is a certain uh, a, a, a doubt that sneaks in to any historian. When you, when you see someone being idolized that much, you almost want to take them down, um, or uh, e even if it's not justified. So I'm constantly... Yeah having that argument. I mean, I had the same argument with myself about Miyazaki. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, was Miyazaki justified in being idolized the way that he was? Was one yeah. of the questions that I asked myself in my PhD. And I actually ended up by saying, yes, not only is he justified in being idolized to the degree that he is, but people have forgotten a whole bunch of things Miyazaki did that are even uh, that are just as influential. Uh, so, for example, in the, in the 80s and 90s, Miyazaki was a fantastically influential critic of anime and you can read Turning Point and Starting Point his collections of essays and you can uh -huh. see really important issues in the history of anime and how anime works being identified by Miyazaki in obscure magazine articles when no one knew who he was mm. um, so yeah I mean you, you, you I, I, I was all, all set to prove that Miyazaki wasn't that important <laughs> and it turned out he was actually more important than anyone thought he was <laughs> well as long as you keep an open mind then you know I think mm. that's the most important part exactly um, so I think kind of we can get her to start wrapping things up but um, it's kind of one big question to finish things up but where what would you say is the importance of sacred sailors because obviously it's it's this landmark achievement but mm. it came out almost nobody watched it relatively speaking mm -hmm. um it was kind of hidden away the japanese government kind of tried to get rid of it then it disappeared and it wasn't until mm. 84 when it came out then in 84 when they tried to push it out again there was so mm. much backlash from some people right and so mm. what what would you say is this a, like an influential work or what is it i th i think uh it's unfair to call it an influential work 
um, mm. because, as you say, so few people, so few people saw it. Uh, Momotaro's Sea Eagles, the one that came out in '43, was much more influential because it was seen all over the Japanese Empire, and a lot of people confused one with the other. That was a constant issue, and in fact, still is today. A lot of people get them mixed up. Um, so it was an influential work behind the scenes because Sacred Sailors was a kind of crucible for many of the talents who would go on uh, to make anime post-war. Um, Kenzo Masaoka in particular um, didn't make a whole lot of anime after the war, but he did teach the generation that would go on to make all the post-war anime. Is, so, is uh, he the one that was... Um the water, right? That he could animate yes, he's the water. water guy. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kenzo Masaoka gave a series of lectures uh, mm-hmm. in the 40s uh, uh, at a, a new animation studio mm-hmm. to a group of people, many of whom were new recruits. Um, so he kind of passed on the pre-war knowledge to the post-war group of people. And what's fascinating about that, and this is one of the things that comes up when you have a concordance and you can look in other people's memoirs, is that you have people a generation later uh, like uh, Noboro uh, Ishiguro when he was a young man going to work anime studios in the 60s and they've got these dog-eared battered yellow copies uh-huh. of the notes that they took at Kenzo Masaoka's lecture <laughs> uh-huh. about how to make fire look realistic in animation about how uh-huh. to animate a drop of water and these lectures which only 24 people went to uh-huh. are still influencing entire studios of animators 20 or 30 years later yeah so that that's an important influence, but it's not just about Sacred Sailors. That's about mm-hmm. the staff who worked on it. Mm-hmm. What I find so interesting about Sacred Sailors is is the window that it gives you into an entirely different world. Mm-hmm. Um, you are not merely watching uh, what the enemy thought in World War Two. You are seeing how they thought their children should be educated, what their attitudes were um, towards the battle that they were fighting. Mm-hmm. Um, you see. Uh, what for them is a, is a nobility of purpose. You, there's a lot in sacred in sacred sailors of the pan Asianism that Japan was trying to push on the rest of um, uh, its empire. So, you know, uh, protecting uh, the people of Asia from the white world. Um, mm-hmm. that, and that is not something that is a particularly popular idea, um, even in Asia itself. But it, it's what the people who made that film genuinely thought or wanted people to think and so that that's fascinating to see something so different and it is chilling to see it it is shocking for me even now to see um little animated characters practicing parachute landings on the united states um it is shocking to see uh uh, uh, foreign uh, gai- gaijin um, uh, soldiers being treated as figures of ridicule and figures of vengeance, um, but you know this is. But that's what's so fascinating about it is to see that window on that world, mm-hmm. which um, it, it's a dangerous. It's, it, it's not influential. It's, it's a dangerous work. It, the, the danger of propaganda was something recognised by the Allied powers in Japan mm-hmm. during the occupation which is why Sacred Sailors was believed to be lost, because there were huge bonfires of propaganda material Mm -hmm. by the Allied powers uh, in 1946. In April 1946, by the side of the river, they just burned hundreds and hundreds of works, not just to remove them from circulation, but to remove them from memory. There's Mm -hmm. this attempt to completely erase the entire notion of a militaristic and fascistic Japan. and so uh, I do feel that Sacred Sailors, it's not something you watch for fun. Let's face it. It's, it's not an enjoyable work. It's often quite an unsettling work. Um, but for the perspective that it brings you on a period in history, um, it's difficult to, to, to fault it. And it, it's an amazing thing to have access to. Mm-hmm. A lot of anime fans won't care. Yeah, about the 1940s. But for that, you know, small percentage who are interested in in where Japanese animation came from and 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 what attitudes were like and what technology was like in 1945, you have this incredible document that you can look at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think for me personally, um, you know, I was able to uh, reading the book first really helped so much because oh, okay. you you get it. it First of all, it puts it in context, right? You kind of mm. see what leads up to it and what was going on behind the scenes. And mm. rather than just being confused by everything that's going on and you explain all the thinking behind the scenes and what yeah. Seo was trying to do. So I think personally, if I were to recommend it to someone that wants to kind of learn more about the history, I'd say check out the book first, get uh, prepped on that 
era of history and then mm. you can uh, appreciate the movie more for what it is and understand it better. Mm, I, I agree. I would yeah. say that because I wrote the book. But I, I, <laughs> I do think that uh, there, there was a, a while ago, someone uh -huh. illegally uploaded onto YouTube a clip yep. from um, Sacred Sailors, yeah. uh, which was shown at an event I did in Finland. I was talking uh -huh. about the film and I showed a clip of the film. Yeah. And it's the one where uh, the, uh, the, the, the the animals are attacking the soldiers yeah. and there's this noise there's this huge noise of battle on screen uh -huh. and uh, in order to get uh, the sound of, of American voices they just ripped the sound off any film they could find right yeah and so in the middle of this battle scene you actually hear someone going taxi taxi <laughs> um, because it's just someone some guy in New York hailing a taxi and it's one yeah. of the audio clips that they got and I said to the audience listen out for this thing um, and so the, the, the thing is playing and it, the sounds a bit shaky and you can't really hear it but you hear the audience laughing and there are all these comments on YouTube people saying how dare you laugh at the sight of american <laughs> soldiers being slaughtered and it's uh -huh. like no they're not laughing at that they're laughing at the soundtrack but it's the, yeah. only the context of why that clip is being shown is going to tell you that right, um, right. so th there's all kinds of issues with it i think and i, I think that a, a lot of old films are difficult to take as entertainment yeah. but if you're interested in film studies and you're interested in the history of film then it mm -hmm. really helps to, to know to know why why you're watching this yeah well it's like you said it's such a different world that when you try to watch it you go like well you, you can't even really comprehend much of it so mm. when you have somebody kind of taking you by the hand and explaining what it is you go like oh okay now this kind of makes more sense you can mm. yeah get a better idea what it is and what they're trying to do uh, I think there is so much more we can talk about, but uh, <laughs> we could keep going on and on and on, but perhaps for another time. Um, yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, so the, the book, at least I got it on Kindle on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is that the main place? Is that where, where people would go to get it? Um, the book was actually printed. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a physical book which mm -hmm. was printed for the british blu-ray release okay so when you buy the blu-ray of uh, of sacred sailors in in the uk you actually get the whole the whole 200 page book oh, um okay. with it um the reason there's a kindle edition is that um it's the, the book is not that easy to find in, in other territories so yeah. so we did a kindle edition as well for those people in america who've got the funimation version that's only got like a little leaflet in the mm -hmm. in the uh in the box instead right. um so yeah kindle is the best place to get the book of sacred sailors and but uh anime a uh, history which is the british mm -hmm. film institute history of, of japanese animation from 1917 to 2012 mm -hmm. uh, that's available in print and on kindle in america and everywhere else okay and the blu-ray is available um through funimation in in the US. That's right. Funimation okay. did the Blu-ray in the US and there's a, there's a leaflet that comes with it with a, mm. a, a bunch of uh, articles in it um, by a bunch of people who aren't me. Wonderful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you. <laughs> All right, there you go. That's Jonathan Clements, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you feel a little smarter after listening to him because... <laughs> man, that guy knows so much. It's just a real pleasure to talk to him. And it's always nice to have a guest on like that because all you need to do is just ask him one question and you can sit back, relax, just be utterly enthralled by all the amazing information that he throws at you. So I'm looking forward to having you on the show again, Jonathan. Hopefully we can work that out in the very near future. If you'd like to get your hands on the Blu-ray or the book that Jonathan wrote or any other book or anything else, uh, you can do so via the Amazon affiliate link on japankyo.com. That will help support the show. We'll get a tiny percentage of whatever you spend. Won't cost you anything extra. If you want to get in touch with the show, with me, you can do so via mail at japanstationpodcast.com. So just shoot us an email. Go ahead, follow us on Facebook at Japankyo, on Twitter at Japankyo News. You can share the show with your friends. Tell them it's a great show. <laughs> they should listen. You can also leave a review on iTunes. That really helps us out. And of course, thank you so much to Unomi for providing the opening and closing song. Oedo Controller. More information can be found in the show notes. So that brings episode three to an end. I hope you enjoyed it. And definitely make sure to subscribe so you don't miss episode four and everything else that's coming down the line. All right. See you next time and go find your miniature pony. Just do it!